Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. And I'm just going to turn this right over to Kathy Siskowski, who's going to be doing the presentation today. Yep. Okay, sooner or later. Um, all right, now, I wrote this out. I'm going to probably read some, talk some, and um, there was so much information is what happened. I've been working, well, as I'll tell you anyway, just a lot of information. So this is what we've got. This is how this has turned out. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about something that happened in Whatcom County in the late summer and early fall of 1913. Borrowing from some of the newspaper headlines about this story, I call it the case of the mysterious malady. I have actually been working on this progress for a couple of years, and it certainly kept me occupied during our modern mysterious malady 107 years later. <clears throat> on July 14, 1913, after two days under a doctor's care, five-month-old white female Ruby Walmsley died with a diagnosis of iliocolitis. She lived in Blaine and her doctor was A. Sutherland. Her parents, Samuel and Daisy Walmsley, were both born in England. I have death certificates, I have copies of death certificates for five people total and besides Ruby, a four-day-old, um, two-year-old, and two, another two-year-old died in the county with the diagnosis of iliocolitis. The fifth person died from gastroenteritis. The last of these deaths was on October 13th. So there were two in July, one in August, one September, and one in October, all with uh, these gastro problems diagnosed generally as colitis. Um, now this death certificate shows that there are 10 more deaths in Bellingham. This is uh, south of the original group of deaths. And these people, these 10 people died from colitis or other diagnoses that would fit the same pattern for the cause of death. And these were from September 1st to October 16th, 1913. From September 20th to September 29th, seven of the deaths occurred. Um, seven of the deaths occurred. So in nine days, seven deaths occurred. Now, there's this is one uh, from a boy who, lived in a family and three of the boys all died within a week of each other. Um, and this boy's name was Glenwood. And it's interesting because they put the address on there of where he died. He died at home and he was in Bellingham. Thank you. Are we? Okay. Okay, so the Bellingham Herald. Now, this is one of the struggles I had. So, so what this presentation is kind of divided into is what happened, uh, uh, the newspaper coverage, and then how I kind of went about trying to figure out what happened during this time when everything was closed during um, the virus pandemic. So our normal channels of research were not available. Um, but this was one of the few articles I could find from the Bellingham Herald. The Bellingham Herald was almost completely inaccessible. All the archives uh, were gone and not available until late in 2020 when they was able, our library actually uh, ordered the microphone for me and um, I went scrupulously through Bellingham Herald's in that way. But this article, Death Lurks in Overripe Fruit. So the Bellingham Herald is 
trying to report on what's been going on with all of these deaths. Um, so that's their main coverage of it. Um, so in this article, they talk about the kids, 10 children were kid by eating decayed fruit, too much decayed fruit, which uh, sounds horrible, really. Um, so, so, okay, here's the weird thing that's happened now is I thought, oh, okay, well, are there any other articles about this? How can I find out more about this? Um, and what happened was that when I started researching it, it turned out like the whole United States was reporting on this epidemic. There were articles from um, El Paso, Boston, Nebraska, Oregon, Omaha, Arkansas, um, everywhere. There were stories about these children, mostly children who died of um, an epidemic, a mysterious epidemic. Because the crazy thing about all this, now I just read you something about fruit. Well, Oakland Tribune, now is talking about an oriental plague. And the uh, uh, speculation was that there was the bubonic plague. They discovered some rats with bubonic plague in Seattle, and they were afraid that they had gotten to Bellingham on ships. So the first real panic about this epidemic had to do with rats. And so a lot of the, uh, let's see here, what's this one? Okay, so a lot of articles were about rats. And this one just, I found this so perfect in terms of media struggles. Um, both of these articles were in the October 8th issue of the Spokane Chronicle. They were the same issue. And here's one about the story that says, they think that rats are the cause of death. Bellingham to take measures to rid, rid the city of plague-ridden pests. And then the next one is how the Bellingham officers um, deny bubonic plague in the, in the city. So, um, so as I went on now, what else do I have here? Okay, so there we have rats. <laughs> um, as I kept reading, um, another newspaper talks about lead arsenic poisoning, that they were really determined that what had killed the children was fruit being uh, poisoned by lead arsenic. So I like this picture. I got some of these pictures from the rural history, just online, you know, um, rural history, what is it called? Archives. And here there are the guys all spraying these trees with lead arsenic. Um, the other kinds of, I mean, there was a lot, there was a lot about fruit, but all the, and it was mostly about peaches. And the diagnosis with peaches was that one, kids had gone in and eaten tons of peaches, way too many peaches, and all these children died from going into their back pantry eating peaches. That was one theory. Another theory was that all these people, and, and again, I think, well, I'll go into this more, but they died because the peaches had been picked underripe and had been ripened artificially. And that's what killed the children, artificially ripe, artificial ripening of the peaches. And another one said the fruit was overripe and it had germs in it. So all these people died because they ate this fruit uh, with, with that. Now, okay, I'm just sort of giving you the facts here of what, all these newspapers all over the country had conflicting reports. And um, so that really was amazing. Um, so this part now I'm gonna talk about 
how I got into this as a project, um, because I need to change something here, I'm sorry. Um, let's change something again. So this is how I got involved with this. So in 2015, I was doing research for an article I was writing for uh, History Link, which is a Washington State online encyclopedia. The article I was writing was on um, uh, Lopez Island, the history of Lopez Island. And I, can't, I just was going through, I, uh, Chronicling America, which is a, a Kong, gosh, I'm sorry, um, a site. And I found this story. And this story had been in the San Juan Islander, October 17th, 1913. And this is what I read. An unusually large number of deaths of children here, if it is believed have been caused from poisoned fruit. Physicians at first were of the opinion that an epidemic of cholera in phantom had developed, but it is now thought that the deaths can be traced to fruit, which had been sprayed with arsenic of lead. And this was in Bellingham. So my just casual thought. So I read this little thing and I think, oh, I wonder what it was that actually did cause the deaths of these children. Just that question. And that's where I've spent the last two years in the world of trying to decipher what, what happened to these kids and a and couple adults. So I started doing everything I could do in the pandemic. And one of the things um, I did was write Washington State historians now, some of you may know this guy, Knut Berger, if you're interested in Washington State history, he has a little show on Channel 9. Uh, his nickname is Mossback, and he's been a driving force in the history uh, of history of Washington State. And at the time I wrote him this letter, he was writing and producing things about the Spanish flu. So my this phase of my research ended up being writing to people like him. You know, I have this giant list of people that I ran into their names somewhere and I wrote them this letter and it all, all the letters sort of have the same thing. So I said, so I have a weird historical Washington mystery that no one else seems to have heard about. I was going through some old newspapers for an article I was writing for History Link and came across a press release from October 1913, about 13 people all dying about the same time in the same area in Bellingham, the fall of 1913. Most of the people who died were children. Turns out that variations of the story ended up in newspapers all over the country and that the suspected cause of death varied in almost every article. Things considered were bubonic plague, colitis, eating unripe fruit, cholera, lead arsenic poisoning. So I wrote a number of historians and was absolutely shocked. Here's um, an, another one. Oops, where'd you go? Um, so here's another one before I go on with that. Uh, Emily Lieb wrote the History Link article on Bellingham, and she did very thorough research about writing about the history of Bellingham and had no mention of this. But I found her, found her address, and wrote to her to see if she'd run across this. And the more I did this uh, with current writers in Bellingham, um, other historians, not one person had heard of this. So that was becoming more and more interesting to me. Like, can I find somebody who's run across it? Um, and anyway, I did not. So Emily Lee, who now is a professor at Seattle U, uh, and these people all wrote me back. 
Um, so they were very kind and are very interested because, you know, if you have that kind of a bent towards these historical mysteries, um, they've all asked to be informed if I have come up with anything. Okay, so. So the two main historians, actually, um, Vicki, I've got to give credit to both Robin Jacobson, uh, one of our group members, there she is, and um, Vicki, because they also helped me find things. Um, I'm researching is really hard. It's like if you're not, uh, as you all know, I don't know. That was a silly thing to say, but so many things, you know, you sort of have to become almost a specialist to find what you want. And so this is what I kind of dealt with. I pick up something to work on and have to go into so much effort to try to learn about it. And um, even just the computer aspect of it. Um, so these two historians, both from Bellingham, ended up being quite helpful to me. Um, Colby Labrie was one of our presenters here um, uh, for our group. And she is really a good researcher and historian. And she right away kind of responded. She was the first person that I wrote to that sent me back information on. Uh, the death register and death register and some death certificates. And so she helped me off and on through the project. This guy, some of you have met, but I'm telling you, if you ever are doing any research in Whatcom County, um, he's kind of the go-to guy. Uh, his name's Jeff Jewell and he works uh, near the Whatcom Museum and he's their photo archive person. And he's also an expert on certain aspects of Bellingham history. And one of the things he knew a lot about was the trolley system and just the general history. Um, and so I was really, really grateful. I got to, I went up there a couple times in person. And again, all this is, way, well, I suppose some of this is even this year, but I corresponded, I talked on the phone. Um, and uh, again, he's somebody who hadn't known anything about this, um, but as time went on, he got more interested and more able to come up with things that might be useful in terms of uh, research. So, my historians. Oh yeah, here, here's what Colby um, sent. Now, cities have these register, death registries. Now I wish I would have copied this other one that I have because they, she underlined all the uh, pertinent ones in yellow, but um, on this death registry in Bellingham, it lists, you know, the names, parents' names, the addresses of where people died, how old they were, who the doctors were, the, the uh, cemetery, and all kinds of information that anybody who is working on genealogy uh, or research would be very grateful to have, which I was very grateful to have. So the registry was a big help and helped us figure out what death certificates to order. So, or find. So, you know, they're out there. There's all, we all know about all these different sites, you know, Ancestry and um, who was the other one? Lisa Oberg, who spoke to our group at one time, who works at the University of Washington in special collections. She gave me a very long, it seemed very convoluted route to get copies of everybody's death certificates but I did it and I got them and um, it helped me figure out what might be going on. Um, one of the things that came clear really quickly was this was all a uh, internal disease like you know uh, COVID is this respiratory issue um, and 
colitis, which is what everybody seemed to be diagnosed with more or less, iliocolitis, um, is the way it manifests, the way this disease manifests that I found through some research was through sudden high fever and intense dysentery that won't stop. And in one girl's case, there was a fever, or, or not a fever, a uh, epileptic seizure. So that narrowed down, like, okay, if I'm trying to find out what the disease was, then I'm, I'm narrowed down now. I can start looking at what kills people quickly, here are the symptoms, and um, so just that little report, I think it was in a newspaper article as well. Um, so when I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit, when I was looking through the newspapers, I started to, I decided I was going to look for things that were disrupting the city infrastructure. Because I had to keep remembering this is 1913, right? So what were the what was the city like back then? You know, what was the water supply? What was the sewage situation? And um, so all of those things took a certain amount of research. And um, so I started when I was here at the library. I copy off articles from the Bellingham Herald where the city council was meeting and they were talking about all the things they were doing to change the city. You know, they were improving a water system. There was one line, this was like one of the most important lines just buried in there in the article in April. It said um, that in the York district of Bellingham, they were going to drain the York district and put in sanitary sewers and uh, for stormwater and sewage. Well, that was a huge red flag to me. Let me see, why do I have her here? Oh, um, so this, uh, I'll go back to that other one, but this is um, the area. It's called Whatcom Falls Station. This is where almost, it turns out, uh, all the Bellingham deaths, not the North Whatcom County, but the Bellingham ones, all happened around Whatcom Falls Station and Whatcom Falls Park. And there was a trolley line that went all over Bellingham, but one of them went out to an amusement park at Silver Beach called White City Amusement Park. And this was one of the stops. And at this stop is where the mill workers, the Blodell, Blodell Donovan Mill was out here. And the mill workers would take the trolley. So now I've got like, oh no, could it have been toxins from the mill that somehow poisoned the water? Um, and so I don't know how well you can see this, um, but you, but if you just sort of follow the line, the little uh, Route line, it turns out that that five mile radius is where most of the deaths occurred. And so the York District is right in there, um, right around there. And again, when I keep thinking 1913, like what my impression is now, it could be very different, you know, 107 years ago of how the city describe their different areas. So, so now we've sort of got it down to like, mostly it happened in this one area. Um, and that's why it was really exciting to me to see that one little line that they were gonna improve the sewer system. Cause I thought that means there's something, the sewer system is not good. Um, so, this is part of that. So after all the newspaper articles had put out their theories, then of course, every time I turned around anything on the media or anything I read, got me thinking about different other things that could have killed people that they didn't even know about in 1913. So when they're busy talking about uh, 
eating the fruit that had been ripened artificially. Of course, that's how we almost always get our fruit, you know, in modern times is uh, through, eth you know, ethylene gas ripens a lot of fruit because sometimes you just can't pick it ripe and get it to your market. So the, um, so then I just kind of went really obsessively um, into what are all the other ways that these people could have died um, that haven't been mentioned, but we know about more in modern times. So it was really fascinating. PBS has a really interesting special about uh, food back the turn of the century and how horrible food was. Um, it's frightening, you know, the kinds of canned food that they sent to the guys in the military, the kinds of things they put in milk uh, to either give it a certain texture or make it seem whiter than it was. So it's really a shocking path to go down is what happened with food. And um, so I just got off on all these different um, avenues of exploration. Um, yeah, and I don't know, this one was kind of funny because at some point I started taking notes because everything you can think of is logical. Like probably, so I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm gonna go to find out what the archive records were for Bellingham Public Health. Well, I called to them and they referred me to Washington State Health and they referred me to the Washington State Archives who referred me to the Northwest Regional Archives. And um, I, I don't know, um, and I, I didn't, I did find a little bit, I have to say, I did find a little bit. They, when they were able to, to go back into the archives, the workers there, they would actually go and pull down some information I wanted and let me know what they found. And, and I like this one. So one of the things I had fun doing just personally during the pandemic, because I didn't go out much like most of us, but I decided on Sunday mornings, this was my big treat, I'd go drive up to the country corner and buy a Seattle Times. And then I'd drive down to Rosario who had takeout on Sunday, well, maybe more mornings, but I'd get it on a Sunday morning. They had donuts sprinkled with lavender sugar and uh, a nice egg thing. And I'd take them down to uh, the water and sit by the water and look at the water. Well, one day I'm sitting down there, it was by the Discovery House and the guy, a guy drives down in a white pickup truck and he's one of the people that's in charge of the Rosario water system. And I've been thinking about this because I'm clueless how water systems work. And I'm thinking, boy, it sure makes sense that maybe these kids and these people could have had bad water. So I jumped out of my car and um, spent an hour chatting up, I think his name was Joel, about, about this. So I just kind of went all over the place and um, kept some notes, didn't. I wasn't planning to do anything with this project because I just thought, oh, I'll just Google it and find out what killed these people. And um, so now this is, now I sort of went a little further than that. Um, so one of the other causes of contamination that makes a lot of sense, but they weren't, they didn't talk about it at all was bad milk. Um, so then I wondered, you know, what other kinds of food contamination uh, milk would make a lot of sense. Um, Oh, and here's back to the city infrastructure changes I was talking about. Um, and <clears throat> even a magazine, I found a magazine called Engineering News and it said a resolution has been adopted by the city council for storm and sanitary sewer system draining the York edition. So that told me an awful lot right there. Now the people who lived in these houses were mill workers. One was a shingle, one 
whose family was affected was a shingle weaver. The other, uh, he was just a carpenter, not just, but that's what he did. And, uh, or just a mill worker, sorry. So there were, there was lots of dredging going on around the waterfront and um, everybody was near Whatcom Creek and Whatcom Creek I found out was actually kind of the main sewage system it seems like. And then just to further confuse me, it turns out that there was this big, huge amusement park called White City at Silver Beach, which was also on Lake Whatcom, uh, not far from, from this place where all these deaths. So I'm thinking, gosh, you know, you could get, everybody can get food poisoning or something at the, at the park. Oh yeah, here's the lumber mill um, on Lake Whatcom. The park now, Bloedel, I think it's the Bloedel Park on the lake, it used to be this giant, giant lumber mill. Bellingham was quite well known for the lumber that it produced. So this one just, this is another frivolous one, but again, I'm guessing you all as genealogists can relate to this. I have three pages where I just went through and uh, put down all my links that, uh, that look like this. I have two more pages like this where I was trying to look up more information. I'd run across an article and I get drawn into it. It looks like around here I'm looking uh, pesticides. Oh, and then here's a bunch about Whatcom Falls and the port. And um, so this is also something that I did keep a record of. This is an interesting story. Now, one of the fun things that happened around this was our son lives in Bellingham. And of course, we were all as you being isolated and everything. Well, we went to Bellingham at Christmas. We decided to be brave and stay at, uh, I think it was the Sheraton Four Points there by Fred Myers and um, be together, you know, be very careful and be masked and everything. But this, I don't know why, they, well, you know, you'll get this when you see why it made me so happy. So we're sitting around dinner, probably eating takeout Chinese, because that's what was sort of available. And um, my son, who likes the history of presidents, he wasn't very interested in my project, uh, or just that was okay. I mean, I get it. <laughs> but he started telling us about President General Zachary Taylor. And the way Zachary Taylor died was he'd been out on the 4th of July in Washington, D.C., and he'd been surveying the building of the Washington Monument. And it was a really, really, really hot day. And by the time he got home, he was just absolutely exhausted. And he ate um, raw vegetables. And then he ate a ton of cherries. And he washed it down with ice cold milk. And the next thing you know, Zachary Taylor is sick, just kind of like these children. And he dies three days later. So this is how we lost that president of the United States. Um, so my son's telling me this story and I'm so happy, you know, cause we're having this conversation. It's kind of a helpful thing to me to go, wow, this is really possible, uh, cherries and milk, huh? And so then of course, yeah, I, I appreciated in some ways, this project is something to bring us together. We spent a lot of Christmas day walking from one part of Whatcom Creek to another, just to get the lay of the land. How could this work? Could you know the, the water really um, be toxic or, or how would this work? So, um, so there was some interesting, I mean, for me, this project ended up being such a project of connection with interesting people and something to think about besides politics and um, our current pandemic. And in the process of learning about 
this pan, the older pandemic epidemic, I certainly learned a lot more about disease and how uh, how things diseases work. Now, oh, I just got to say Zachary Taylor, of course, then I went off on that. And it turns out that there's, they thought maybe it wasn't the cherries and milk that killed him. Maybe it was contaminated sewage. Again, Washington, D.C. was sort of a cesspool. This was in 1850. And so could these um, fruits and vegetables and cherries actually have been contaminated by, you know, bacteria? you know, salmonella or E. coli or something, which they wouldn't have known about. Um, okay, so here's the personal part. Now I had to keep, I wanted to give this presentation specifically to our, um, our group here as focusing a little bit on resource material. Like, what do you do when you're trying to research something and you don't have your normal channels available? Um, so that's what I focused on here. And I, I could have gone totally off on all the individuals um, involved in this. Like, well, who were these children? Who were their family? Who were their descendants? Um, all of that. And I did end up doing that to some degree. And this picture is one of the things I got pulled in. There were three families in particular. One family had four people die, the grandma and the grandpa and two little girls. Their last name was Cummings and the grandma and grandpa were John and Jane Bannerman and then uh, the little girls, Violet, Cummings and I can't remember her sister. And um, there were three boys, uh, the Conrad brothers, and they were, yeah, the Conrad brothers. And the other family was the Ager family. And these two little girls both died. And this picture just really touched me. Um, this was on Find a Grave. And I'm sure many of you know about Find a Grave. Um, this particular family, there had been some descendants, I think, who had written something. They wrote this on there. Um, so the family story is that they these girls died during a cholera epidemic. Um, so... <clears throat> So I did get um, connected in that heart way that you do. You know, I went to we, one of the little field trips we took with the family was to go to the Conrad's house. I had their address. The death certificates had their address to go to their house and just see where it was. Just try to figure out. So we actually took a trip around to see where all these people's houses were because I had a lot of addresses. So as time went on and I learned more about story, the stories, as I was able to find more in the Bellingham Herald, um, I got more com connected, I guess, with these families. And the thing that, well, there's two more things I'm gonna say, um, no, three. Most of these children, were very, very, very little. Like a, a lot of them were, you know, three and under infants. And um, the speculation to me about fruit, like a lot of the speculation was ended up at the end of all this being about the fruit, that these kids all got into fruit, don't let them get into fruit. I just went, mm, these little babies aren't going to be crawling around in the back room getting into the canning uh, fruit. And um, so that did not ring true with me. Um, well, I'm saying more than I thought. So, so that was sort of one of these little red flags, like, okay, what's going on? This is not 
a diagnosis. See, I could have given this whole talk and said, yeah, I did find out what killed those children. It was colitis, because that's on all the different death certificates, but something had to cause the colitis. Um, and it was only in this short period of time. And uh, it didn't make sense to me with the age of these, these children. Now I did learn there's something called summer diarrhea that millions of kids all around the world die of something called summer diarrhea. And maybe, hopefully somebody will know more than I do about this. Um, and they don't really know why what it is. So that was something I learned. Something I got interested in is it turned out that in 1911, there was a big typhoid outbreak in Yakima, but the city hushed it. Um, the city did not want anybody to know about it and they didn't publicize it. They didn't want people to think of their town as you know, being a town with illness and uh, not coming, people not coming there to work or to be a tourist. And I sort of in the back of my mind thought, huh, you know, they, if it is bad water, bad sewage, are the, the powers that be not gonna let people know, you know, that suspicion we all have about authority like that. There was a newspaper article that a professor came to town and spoke and said it could not be lead arsenic poisoning because you have to have tons of lead arsenic before it will slowly kill you. So I felt like I could cross that off. I felt like uh, they did do, they said they did a water test and the water was pure and that was in the paper. So I crossed that off. Um, and so, um, okay, so that's what I want to say about that. Um, one of the things, the thing that made me <laughs> want to give this report today is because I thought I have to stop. I think when you take up a mystery like this, I will never know the answer. There's never going to be something that comes out of 1913 that's going to be just an article that gives me the true answer. Be because we even see that today. Just last night, I was looking at something and uh, it's a report of salmonella, 25 cases. They have no idea where the people got it. I mean, we're still in that process. Like what is, what's out there and how do people get it? And um, so I thought, I just have to stop. I can't do this anymore. Now I've talked to Huxley College, which is the environmental college in Bellingham. And they were interested in taking this up as a project. I think it would be a really great student project to go further um, and deeper than I am able to go. So I'll probably after today, well, the irony too is that tomorrow is the first day that the uh, Center for Pacific Northwest Studies, which holds any more information I want, want to, might, want, might want to find, is open. So, so it's interesting to be giving this one day before the final um, foray into more information. But um, so I, I have to say towards the end of my research with the Bellingham Herald, which was quite arduous, um, I thank the library so much for getting me these uh, microfilm copies of the Herald and for our library having the foresight to have this microfilm machine, it really helped me. But it's a very difficult process to sort of find things that you want, it's not indexed. So I did a lot of sitting on a stool, um, looking, looking, looking. But I found this amazing, amazing story that's just made me so happy. So this is the story. Um, do I have him in here? This guy. So C.E. Cleary was the mayor of Bellingham at the time. And he put out a call 
for the for Bellingham, people of Bellingham, to contribute to something he just started called a subscription. And it's just like a modern GoFundMe. He put $50 into the subscription fund to give to the Conrad family because he talked to Mr. Conrad. This is the guy who had the three little boys that died. And Mr. Conrad said, you know, on a Monday morning, our family was having breakfast. We were all fine, relatively, you know, happy. And he said, by the next Monday, I'd buried three of my children. And his wife was sick. And he was beside him. I mean, he was just beside himself. And so he had talked to the mayor and the mayor started this fund and asked people to contribute. And um, people from the churches were contributing. And I guess this act of compassion and all of that, I was just so happy to read it. Now, he still never said, you know, they just call it something, this epidemic, or like I said, this mysterious malady, or they just have all sorts of sort of cute names for what's going on. And it never comes out what it really is, or at least I couldn't find it. Um, you know. Um, so now what I'm gonna do, so so there was that. That was kind of the end of all that research, and it ended with this nice city taking up, you know, people did contribute and um trying to help this family. Um now after I got attached to these children, um I thought it might be nice to go to Bayview Cemetery. Most of the these families in Bellingham were buried in Bayview Cemetery and Colby. Um, oh, I'm going backwards, aren't I? Sorry. So Colby, who runs a she has a company called the Girl Good Time Girls and takes people on tours. And she actually has a cemetery tour, but she did this specifically for, for me. Um, she did her research and looked up the families and took us around to the different graves. Now, this is, again, my, my wonderful family who took these little adventures with me. There's Colby in her outfit, um, I guess her graveyard outfit. And so we went to the cemetery, we picked up some roses and went to the cemetery. And um, there I am, I can't remember whose graves. Most of the graves, I was surprised that I don't think any actually had headstones. One, one lady, one of the, the grandma did, Jane Bannerman. So there's, I think this, uh, yeah, there's the, where the children, two of the children are buried, two or three actually. Yeah, three, I've got three roses. And so we laid some roses and walked around and talked about the families and, um, and I, oh, little side note. I went to Bellingham a few weeks ago to write this up. You know, I, I like I say, I decided I have to finish, I have to finish. And um, I had j just stumbled across, sitting there in the little Airbnb writing this up, I stumbled across the article again about the sewer system getting fixed. So as I was driving down to the city library to do a bit more research, I happened to look out the window and on Lakeway, there's a sewer uh, office. Like I just saw this, Geneva sewer uh, office. So I thought, well, gosh, okay. So I pulled in right there, it was right by Fred Meyer and had a wonderful talk with a woman named Roxanne at the counter who turned out to be a genealogist, but she said, okay, here's some ideas for you. But she said, you should definitely go visit Nelson's market. And it turns out, uh, Nelson's Market has been in the York District in Bellingham since 1895. And 
the woman who owns Nelson's Market, she was home and we spent all afternoon talking about the neighborhood and what it was like. She's like the main oh, historical interest in that neighborhood. So they'd actually put a map together and everything of the neighborhood. And she was talking about all the different little corner stores in these various neighborhoods in Bellingham. And they were just one of the corner stores, but it got me thinking again, you know, maybe uh, the fruit, people just go pick up their fruit at one of the corner stores, maybe something, maybe that was a common thing. Um, so, so it was an odd, uh, you know, again, little twist of fate, just like, okay, I'm gonna turn in here to the sewer, talk to somebody. And I had a wonderful time talking to the woman who owns this market. And so I keep running into interesting little twists and turns. I keep learning things. And it was fun to meet so many people interested in history. And it was just a, you know, such a different kind of conversation. So with that, I have to say, I did not find the answer. I, oh, uh, no, that's, I have a friend who's a public health pediatrician who goes around the world and understands these weird diseases. And we talked a little bit and sort of came to, you know, one of those speculation conclusions that probably because of the symptoms, um, it was an, E. coli infection. Hmm. So I found that, uh, you know, I'll take that. I'll, I'll do that. It makes sense with everything that sort of got put together. And, you know, those things weren't even named back then. Um, so it was fun to talk to him about that um, and to have this, you know, expert right there and say, okay, here's what I've been doing. Here's what I found. And um what do you think so again i probably never know it's okay um but that's what i've been doing the last two years so uh, i guess i'm just encouraging everybody if you take up a project there are all kinds of creative ways to find out things you want to know <laughs> thank you and i can take questions <laughs> That was great. You're right. It's more questions than answers. <laughs> so that's it. So.